Okay. Hello, Internet. Hello, Internet. <laughs> Alright, I am uh, recording my talk from Game City uh, just yesterday in a uh, chippy. This, this uh, talk is brought to you by Food House. This is brought to you by Food House, Fish and Chips, Delicious. So, um, hello. Hello. Mm. Hi, Robin. Please feel free to interrupt me through the talk if you have questions and if you want things to be explained. This should last about... Huh? Our games are art. Games are not art. Okay, so... Yeah, so yeah, now that we're done with that. Uh, hi, I'm Robin Arna. I am the uh, sound designer of Antichamber, Capsule, The Stanley Parable, um, and I'm also a game designer. I made Deep Sea a few years ago. Uh, Deep Sea was this uh, game where the player had to wear a gas mask, and uh, the gas mask blinded them, and as they played, their breathing uh, would... Uh, make it more difficult to play the game because they go <laughs> and then that would translate in the game to <laughs> and the gameplay had you trying to listen to where the monsters were uh, but if you were breathing it was really difficult to hear where they were um, and the, the results were quite scary um, and I'm here at Game City with uh, what I consider to be a direct sequel to that uh, called Sound Self um, so uh, I'm going to be, in this uh, talk, I'm going to be talking about um, something that I've been learning a lot about recently, uh, illusions. And uh, that the talking about illusions is going to be the bulk of the talk. I'm then going to move on to my favorite illusion, which is the perception of self and uh, the boundary around the perception of self. And then I'm going to move on to talking about how, in sound self, we hack that perception of self. So, let's get started. But first, a little history of sound self. Okay, so mention deep sea game where blah blah blah, scary, uh, breathing, etc. Um, in 2010, I was kind of on the tails of developing deep sea, um, and deep sea was a really effective experience. People got really scared by it, by my weird little experiment, and I spent a lot of time kind of trying to work out why it worked so well. Um, and. I don't have all the answers, but I have a few answers to that, which I've been sort of implementing into Sound Self and, uh, and learning about how we got into players' skin with that. Um, but I was thinking about this. Why did this game work so well? And in 2010, I think it was, I was at Burning Man, and uh, I found myself in this structure called Reunion. Now, a reunion was a garlic-shaped structure, and each, if you imagine each of these cloves of garlic that you could sit in or lie in, uh, each one had different projection on the wall and a different track of music, and the music tracks all kind of came together in this really beautiful way. And I was on a mild dose of LSD, and uh, in one of these chambers, I began chanting, because I personally find chanting to be extremely grounding and powerful to me personally. And... Uh, just by coincidence, this was not an interactive piece, uh, but just by coincidence, as I began chanting, the music track of the garlic clove that I was in filled with voices, with choral voices, people going, oh, and it felt to me in that moment like those voices were a part of my voice, and like the space those voices were filling was a part of my body, and like this structure itself was a part of my body, and like the whole festival, and you could go on and on and on, and like everything was a part of my body. It gave me this really tremendous sense of expansive self. And since then, uh, I've been thinking, well, if this is a, an experience possible with chemical assistance, it's all the brain, right? Surely this is this expansive sense of self must be something that is, is possible without chemical assistance. And I've been kind of focusing my work on answering the question of how we might be able to do that. My first answer to that question, or my first exploration of that question... Mm, was Synapse. Synapse was a project built for Burning Man. So you know how when you're dancing you sort of find isolated beats in music and you move to them and you might move different body parts to different elements of the music you're hearing? Synapse was built around this idea but to do the reverse where the music would form around your movement. The idea here being to help create this sense that the music was a part of your body. It worked pretty well. Um... Sound Self is um, sort of my next experiment on, on this, and it's, it's far more successful. Um, 
I, uh, I took Sounds off to Burning Man just a few months ago. Burning Man is sort of a very large part of my story. I've, I've had a lot of inspiration uh, from Burning Man, and uh, I'll be getting more into the, the Burning Man side of Sounds off later on. Uh, but I want to stress that uh, Sounds off is not an installation experience. It's just we've modded it for installation at various places. Uh, one of my goals with Sounds off was to make something that anybody could play without requiring bizarre hardware or installation. Um, so... What is Sound Self? What is Sound Self? What is Sound Self? <laughs> um, Sound Self is, uh, I describe it as a trance experience. Um, it uh, begins with uh, the player's voice, the player chants, oh, and abstract visualization and sound moves with the player. It, the idea is to draw the player into a trance state where their sort of sense of self dissolves into that sense of everythingness that I was describing earlier. Um, it, um, let's see, I have some notes here. Yes, it uh, takes advantage of uh, certain illusions in the way that we perceive and, uh, and certain loopholes in the way we perceive to, to facilitate that expansive sense of self. Um, what are those loopholes? I'll be getting into that. That's the end of the talk. That's the, that's the how uh, we're hacking the illusion part of the talk. Um, so, before we get there, though, I want to talk about illusions in general because I find illusions to be extremely exciting. So, uh, what is an illusion? Illusion is sort of like a bug in the code. Um, and uh, if we think of the definition of a bug, a bug is when your program is not behaving properly. Um, illusions are sort of like this. Illusions are sort of when your perception is not behaving properly and it returns to you a, uh, an impression of the universe that is not reflective of, of, or, or is not accurate, if you like. Um, we all know a whole lot of examples of visual illusions. Here's a couple of them. The, this is a really famous one where uh, you have two tabletops, and these are the same shape tabletops, but um, uh, because of the positioning of the legs, it looks like the uh, they are. Um, it looks like one is much longer and one is much fatter. Um, and I actually had to sort of test this to make sure that that was the case, but they definitely are the same shape. Um, here's another illusion that's really nice. If you look at the center of that, the snakes look like they're whirling around. So I'll give you just a second to look at that. Do you, are you guys getting that impression? Yes. Yeah. Um, but of course, illusions don't just come in uh, the visual form. They are also in an audio form. actually never ascending tone. It's a combination of a few other things. And of course, how could a tone be ascending and ascending and ascending and still remain within your ability to perceive it? Um, because you can only hear up to about 15,000 hertz. Um, there's also um, a kind of feeling illusions. For example, if you have three bowls of water, uh, a hot bowl on your left, a cold bowl on your right, and a room temperature bowl in the center, you dip your hands into the side bowls, for about a minute, and then move your hands into the center bowl, your left hand will report to you that this center bowl is very cold, and your right hand will report to you that the center bowl is very hot. So uh, these are sort of ways that your mind tricks you. Um, so um, I want to talk about synesthesia. Um, synesthesia is, now let me find this here. I don't need to find it right now. Um, but um, uh, synesthesia is um, where we perceive senses to be sort of blurred. Um, and we talk about synesthesia as though it's something that's restricted to only a few people. A few people who might perceive certain numbers of ha as having a color quality, or certain words as having a color quality. But, this is not a disorder of some sort that is limited to a few people. We are all synesthetic. Every single one of us. Every single one of you is synesthetic. Um, it's just that for most of us, the boundaries between our senses are a little less blurred than uh, synesthetics. Um, you can see this, uh, for example, in the screen shake effect, which is used in video games all over the place. When you see screen shake, uh, as in <coughs> Vlambeer games, for example, I'm about to show the uh, uh, something from Luftrausers. I'm not going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to... Sorry. Um, but when you see that screen shake, that's visual sound. You perceive that as a sound... But um, but it's only coming through visually. 
it's the vibration that is is kind of interpreted by your mind as being uh, as being a sound. So, going back to our description of what is an illusion, a bug in the code, if you like, where the program is not behaving properly, I think there's a much better description of an illusion because, of course, there are no actual bugs in the code of our mind. Um, so, here's my new definition. A bug is a word we use to describe when a program is behaving in a way that doesn't conform to our expectations of what the program is for. But, of course, there are no bugs in human perception because it takes human perception to first identify what human perception would look like if it were behaving properly. And then to identify experiences that do not conform to that expectation. The bug itself is an illusion. Are you interested? <laughs> um, does that make sense? Awesome. So, illusions are not what happens when your brain is, stops working properly. Illusions are just what your brain does. Here's a mug. I'm about to get on to my favorite illusion. Um, a mug, you look at this mug, and it has these boundaries around it. You can look at it and see this is a mug, right? And you can connect that to your memories of mugs, and, and so you'll know, ah, I can put a uh, fluid in this and drink from it. Um, but the boundary is, of course, an illusion. The boundary is something that your brain makes up around this particular set of molecules to help you connect that item to memory so that you can know how to use this. And it's an incredibly useful illusion because without that illusion, I don't know how we would be able to, to live. Um, you certainly wouldn't be able to connect certain sets of molecules to, to memories. Um, but this boundary, um, this perception of boundary, uh, it, it's quite firm, you know? It's built into our mind. It's hardware. Um, but these boundaries are not inflexible. For example, in football, uh, if you're watching football, uh, or if you are uh, watching a sport, imagine if you had never seen a sport before. Uh, you would see all the players running around in the field, and you would perceive the boundaries are being around the individual players. But with experience, we learn to identify not just the individual players, but for our sense of a boundary to expand to include the whole team. And the important thing is here is that neither of these boundaries is more correct than the other boundary. Uh, it's just one is more useful to us in certain situations, and we learn through experience which boundaries are more useful than others, given the context. So, moving on from illusions in general to my favorite illusion, or the illusion I'm most interested in in any way, which is the boundary around our perception of ourselves. So, here's a self I'm particularly attached to. Um, and I have to scroll down here to see the rest of my talk. Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Ah, okay. Illusions of self versus not self. So this illusion is uh, the sensation... Um, and most illusions, like the ones I was going through b before, the ones that we identify as illusions, are sort of transient in nature. You engage with them and then you disengage. But they're really interesting because even though you know they're there, they don't disappear. So this boundary illusion and this illusion of the boundary itself is a, an illusion that doesn't dis disappear. It is, utterly, um, it is utterly persistent. And so we can experience these things and forget that they're an illusion. And you have to really confront them in this way to, to recognize them as such. Um, so, the boundary of self versus not self. Um, this is the illusion of there being a membrane, uh, imagine it as a skin, outside of which is not me, and inside of which is me. Uh, and this is an incredibly useful perception, uh, or an incredibly useful illusion, because without this illusion, uh, if you were to cut open my skin, for example, uh, any that sense of there being a self at all would, would disappear because I would die. So it's really useful to our survival. It's useful for the perpetuation of that code that we were talking about earlier. Um, but just like these other illusions, just like the mug, just like the, uh, the sports team, this illusion is also extremely flexible. Uh, for example, when you're playing a video game, your sense of self expands to include the avatar in the video game. Nobody thinks, I made Mario jump by pressing the A button. You think, oh, I jumped. 
Um, but this happens also when you're driving a car. When you're driving a car, your sense of self expands to include the car, and this helps you spatially sort your way out and avoid traffic. Uh, when you are running a company, your sense of self might expand to include the rest of the company. When you're having really great sex, your sense of self expands to include the other personality. So humans like to do this stretch this boundary. I mean, uh, it's really good for us. Uh, it keeps us limber, mentally limber. Um, it helps us anticipate others, uh, other people, other animals. Um, it improves social cohesion, which of course is extremely important for pack animals like ourselves, for the perpetuation of our code. Um, so my goal uh, in my work is to stretch that boundary. I find it really interesting to stretch that boundary and to stretch it as wide as I can, to break it open, to, to stretch it infinitely wide if I can. Um, there are a lot of words for this. Um, there's the word... Um, uh, people described this earlier. I described uh, at Burning Man having a psychedelic experience, but there's all sorts of ways of describing this. People describe it as a religious experience, as godhead, uh, as uh, ego death, and if you want to get all scientific, it's called a persistent non-symbolic consciousness. Um, so here's uh, why I hack this boundary, why I find this to be particularly interesting. Uh, and it all kind of comes down to trance. So when people recognize this, uh, oh no, that's back, that's how, excuse me, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, anyway, when people recognize this elasticity of a sense of health, self, it makes empathy come much easier, kindness, love. Um, it's from my own experiences with stretching that sensation of self through uh, psychedelics, meditation, etc. Um, I have found that it makes me very familiar with the elasticity of boundaries altogether, which aids in the creative process. Um, but I think most importantly to me is that this is a really interesting technical and creative challenge. So here's how I hack it in sound self or in general. Uh, we start with trance, and I don't quite understand why, although I have some theories, but trance all comes down to mental loops. We were talking about this earlier. Um, so we start in sound self with a breath cycle. Oh, like that. And by drawing players' attention to the cycle of their breath, at first, I mean, it grounds them in their body, but it also keeps their attention looping back and forth, back and forth, which sort of begins to draw players into a trance state. <coughs> We then integrate synesthesia. I was talking about synesthesia before, the blurring of lines, screen shake. Um, we do this by, we create a synesthetic relationship first between the player's voice and the game's audio by matching the tone of the game's audio with the player's voice. So if you're going, oh, the game is also going, oh, but adjusting its timbre and the illusion, the illusion is that the game's audio is a part of your voice. Then we create a synesthetic relationship between the game's audio and the visuals in the game, hopefully uh, uh, extending the synesthetic relationship between the player's sense of self, their voice, and everything they're perceiving, uh, at least audio and, audioly and visually. Um, then we use a technique called brainwave entrainment. This is some pretty new science, and in my research of it, it's sort of difficult to separate the science from the pseudoscience. So I'm doing, I'm experimenting as I can, and I don't have any firm answers, but here are some things I find exciting about brainwave entrainment. Um, your brain has certain rhythms. Normally these rhythms are isolated all across your brain. So you have parts of your brain moving like this, and parts of your brain moving like that. By moving, I mean, you know, voltage cycles. Um, so, um, normally your brain is, doesn't have unified voltage cycles through it, but there are two particular mental states that have a unified voltage cycle across the brain, and that's deep sleep and, med and um, sort of trance experience meditation. Um, what's important about these mental states, when you have a unified vibration, is that's when parts of your brain over here are talking to parts of your brain over here. That's when memories are formed. That is when your perception of the universe that you interact with every day is formed and changed. And by the way, this is why uh, short cycle sleep patterns, where people think, you know, I could just sleep for 30 minutes at a time, and then that's really bad for you, because, like, you talk to people who have done this before, and they don't have memory of that period they were doing it. They just weren't forming memories. <coughs> Um, so we can actually draw people into that state with trance um, by, I mean, first I was talking about drawing people into a meditative state at all, but there's a few tricks we can use to kind of uh, trick the brain into synchronizing with itself. Um, one trick is, where are we drinking? Soon. 
just beside us. Excellent. Got it. Um, so one of the techniques for doing this is called uh, binaural beats. Binaural beats is where you play a tone ooh, through one ear and another tone. You know what this is. An another tone ooh, just slightly higher, just slightly lower in the other ear. And your brain, because these are close enough that your brain thinks they're the same sound, it tries to sum them together in your head and make sense of them. And so what is two separate tones you perceive as one tone, but because of the variation in frequency, you perceive it as having a beat. Like this. This is really interesting. It's, it's, it's worth trying. Uh, play sound self. Um, so what this does is it gets your left brain and your right brain actively kind of working together, and it creates that synchronization of beat across the, the brain, which helps bring you into a meditative state. It actually like gives me some control over driving you into that state and then taking you out of it again. Uh, so, a couple of other techniques that I, I use in sound self. Um, and this is how I get you into a trance. Once you're in a trance, what's important is um, uh, I use abstract visualization. Um, what's important about abstract visualization, it is sort of a blank slate for you to project your imagination on. Um, and people experience all sorts of different things in this blank state. It's extremely personal, which, which I think makes it sort of special. Um, there's a, a form of, uh, or a model of looking at abstract visualization that I'm particularly interested in right now uh, called uh, sacred geometry. And I really dislike this word because it's incredibly loaded. And with the study of sacred geometry also comes um, sort of creation of certain symbols. This, for example, if you look at it, is called the, I think that's the, I have it written down here. I think that's the egg of life or flower of life. That's the flower of life. Um, but I don't see this as being having an intrinsic flower of life quality. You know, this this isn't more intrinsically flower of life like than this, for example, uh, or this. So, what's important though about these geometric forms is not the symbol attached to them, a flower of life or a tree of life or an egg of life or whatever, um, but is that they are full of layered symmetries. And your brain, which is a pattern-finding machine, see, identifies these symmetries and goes through them and, and starts working on them. Um, it gets your brain very excited, but there are more symmetries layered in the image than you can grok, than you can understand. And so your brain just starts working on them, and what you perceive is wow. It's sort of like when you see a beautiful face. What makes a face beautiful is its symmetries, it's how it signals to your brain, this is a uh, brain, this is a potential mating partner, this is a healthy human being. But what you perceive from that consciously is just wow. So, uh, we were talking about how we hack that perception of self. I was talking about driving a player into a trance state, and then once they're in that trance state, giving that ecstatic sensation of wow. An ecstatic sensation at a reflection of themselves, of wow. Um, before I end the talk, I just want to talk about some dangers of this. Because this is not like hypnosis, this is hypnosis. Um, which, of course, when one is hypnotized, as we are hypnotizing players in sound self, one is in an extremely su suggestible state. Um, which has a few dangers with it. We're trying to avoid these dangers by focusing on abstract imagery, um, but when one is seeing these abstract images and reflecting on them and projecting a sense of self into them, when one gets a, you, you perceive symbols, you perceive ideas, um, and there's a danger if somebody has this really expansive sense of self experience and attributes meaning to the particular symbols they imagine instead of to the experience themselves. This is how uh, religions and those sorts of things form. Um, it's kind of dangerous, and I really don't want any cults forming around this. Uh, cult of sound self. I really don't want that. So, sound self what? Sound selfism. Sound selfism. Ugh, I hope not. Um, but so that's danger one, and that's a really big thing on my mind right now. Um, danger two is that since you're in such a suggestible state, and we want to make this moddable. Um, is that you are also suggestible to advertisement or to not just like creating a religion or a set of ideas around what you perceive, but also like if you play the game and I whisper in your, your ear, Fernando, join the cult of sound self, join the sound self, give me all your money. You know, you're in a really susceptible place and I'm not saying you would give me all your money, but this is 
hypnosis is a very strong thing. And I think we, we have this illusion that we are sort of immune to it, but we're not. We're not. And there's also this illusion and this, this popular idea that you can't be hypnotized uh, if you do not first consent to it. But that is absolutely not true. And it's dangerous to believe that because it it leaves you open to being taken advantage of. Um, however, um, we've been, I mean, we've had Sound Self available for people to download for a while now. And um, we haven't encountered any of these problems yet. And I think that the benefits of meditation outweigh the risks here. Um, so I've got written here, meditation is a valuable practice of self-reflection and body awareness. And experiences like this, well, sound self is intrinsically meditative. I've had players who have no prior experience or practice of meditation who are literally meditating within 15, 20 seconds. It's like a shortcut. And I think that's really valuable. Um, so also it is... As with psychedelics, it is a new and unusual sensation of self, and any new and unusual sensation of self I think is also intrinsically valuable because it makes you question things that you take for granted, and that's really great. Um, so with that in mind, uh, do you, any of you guys have any questions? Anything I haven't answered? Would you like to join Sal and Self as well? <laughs> I think we're going to... I don't know. Right now... No, to join all of your everything. It'll cost you everything. Just a fish and chips, actually. Um, mm. Okay, well, I have... I, mean, I thought it was really interesting that you uh, you're talking about the dangers at the edge. Of, like, I mean, it's kind of what we were talking about earlier about, you know, being swept along with the crowd of that mob mentality in a sense as well. Mm. And um, so, like, what I, what I find really interesting, are you going to... When the players are in this uh, state that you've brought them into... Over the course, because I know you're aiming for like a narrow, long experience or something. Mm -hmm. Are you going to like direct them into different directions, like over the course of it? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna move people through a whole lot of different visual and audio systems, and by giving all a lot of variety to those abstract experiences, I hope to kind of offer a lot of opportunities for projection of meaning and intention and reflection. So it's not gonna be just the orb in the middle and the spinning thing around. We're going to move between a whole lot of things, but keeping them mostly pretty abstract, I think. There's something actually I was talking to Fernando actually earlier on. Um, here, I'm going to move this here. So. Okay. Uh, something we were talking about earlier on was just the, the, the role of analogy in games, essentially. So the game feel is built up of all these like separate parts. So there's the visual aspect, there's the touch aspect. Um, and we're talking about jo yeah. Well, I was talking about George is giving a talk right now where he's he's arguing that the the kinesthetic experience or your feel of the buttons defines game feel, whereas more so it's I, f I feel like it's it's everything kind of contributed to a whole. But what what I find interesting, I was thinking last night uh, talking with y Jonas, um, he was looking at to human I think or something, and when you jump in that game, there's no sound, until, and then there's a sound when you land. But if you think about Mario, like what's happening is that sound is the sound of Mario jumping, what what is actually doing? It, it's providing a shortcut for you. It's providing you the feedback that you don't get from the physicalness. Like if you were to jump in real life, you'd be physically jumping. Right. Whereas in a, in a, in a game sense, there's all these analogies that you're tapping into. And, and what's really cool in here is like that you're very much reducing the player's experience to like a very pure interaction and a very and to put them in a different state of mind as well. So I mean, yeah, I, I'd just be interested to see what you think of. The, like how these different things interact and how the what role I guess analogy and how like the, I don't know the game feel I just like ramble on that topic for a minute It'd be yeah, interesting yeah, I, could, I could respond to that um, I feel I feel like this is definitely something that we've been exploring in games for a long time um, it's just very rarely explored quite so directly um, so but I mean any video you game you play any good video game you play. Sorry, that's so judgmental. I don't know. I'm sure there, but but uh, most most video game developers are thinking about exactly the thing, same thing. Maybe just not quite in the same terms. And I think that since most video games are trying to engage you on a conscious level, um, they can't really, um, they can't really so focus on the, because what you're talking about is a very unconscious thing, right? You know, um, and they're doing it, but they're also they're doing it to facilitate a conscious experience uh, or a deliberate experience like a strategic or intellectual experience or, or whatever. 
so I guess with I mean, what I'm really interested in is, is game feel, the feel of a game. It's a very abstract medium, whereas most games are, like, overly reliant on, um, like, as you say, a consciousness, a very, like, concrete things in the game. Whereas if, this, like, for instance, the sound changing is a very, like, if the sound is interactive, that's a very, like, um, abstract relation to what's happening. And so the, what the player is trying to do is trying to, like, is thinking about that in, a, in, a, in another way, I think. And I find that really interesting that... It's like like music is a very abstract medium. You can express things through music, but it's not a very it's not a direct relation. And I find it really interesting that these games appear now that aren't interested in like concrete like things and concrete relations, but like exploring abstract relations and abstract reactions to things. And I just I feel yeah, that just that like the synesthesia of it is really interesting how the how the sound affects your visuals because I think I mentioned to you as well does that there's that there's a famous like experiment where there's a guy saying a word, I think it's like cow or something, and there's just a video of him saying it, but then they use the same recording, so it's the same audio, but they change the visual and so his mouth is like saying a different word and that makes you literally hear a different word, even though it's the exact same audio, which is really interesting. It's how they all affect each other. And yeah, I mean I'm just kinda like talking around subjects at the moment. I find that really interesting how they're all kinda interrelated and how they affect each other. And in a sense, how we've kind of missed the boat with games, in the fact that game feel and the reaction is is a, is an is an abstract medium that we haven't realized. We've tried to be like make it concrete all this time, which is interesting. I know I don't know if you want to talk about any of that. Yeah, yeah, I can I can reflect on that. Um, I think that um, well, firstly, I think it's really exciting that I I feel like and I use the word video dream. I feel like. Thank you. I like Video Dream too. Um, I'm really glad it's kind of hit taking taking off a little bit. I've heard somebody else say it. Like yes, why about you? You both. You both. That's what matters. Um, but I really love that. And for me, kind of, for me personally, it was sort of Proteus that opened those doors, and we're seeing more and more people really actively engaging not the intellectual mind, but the the sense of self in the moment. I mean, Panoramical. This this guy made Panoramical. This is Fernando. Yeah, yeah. Um, but music games as well, uh, like Pixel Junk 4AM or something like that, is, um, and even uh, to maybe a slightly lesser degree because it's a little more gamified, but like the upcoming Fantasia or Dance Central and those things, I really feel like those are about engaging that sense of self in the moment. Um, I don't think we really miss the boat because I think we're catching the boat now. Yeah, I mean, up until now, we just like, hmm. haven't realized kind of what we're doing in a sense. Yeah. Not only now are we kind of exploring this aspect, I mean, Yo. Oh, sorry. That's a way better idea. Yeah. Only now are we, because ex- I couldn't hear what I was saying either. Only now are we exploring these other aspects and exploring, I mean, in a sense, it's installations and stuff as well, like different ways of interacting with the game, which is like one thing that's really interesting about Sound Self. I mean, where I've seen it so far is that it's it creates its own kind of space that the player kind of, well, the person, it's not really a player, the, like the the audience kind of crosses over into the threshold, into this room, which has been like dimly lit, it's got like cushions on the floor, and like you're very tempted to lie on your back and maybe the screen might be above your head. And it is about this like full experience rather than just like playing a game with control, because all that is part of the experience as well. It's yeah. like how you interact with it is so important. And only now are people exploring, like, because well, you said in the beginning, like there was arcade cabins always built around the game, which was yeah. interesting, that was such a core part of it. And especially for narrative, like it was all done in the arcade cabinets and stuff as well. But that this, that people are not realizing how important that is for how, what a game like feels like and how a game is to play. And so I think it is really exciting. And they are realizing because like there's a kind of a, like a comeback to to that as well. Yeah. To physical. There's kind I of mean, a lot. Like panoramical is perfect because panoramical is all about these like physical controls. I mean, I mean, for one, it's easy for people to get into because they're not like scared of a controller. But two, it's like you're exploring like what these dials do and like you're having this kind of conversation with the game, which is interesting in, in like, well, that's actually a really good point in sound self. Like you're having a conversation with the game itself and the game mm-hmm. is like pointing back to. And one thing I'm really interested in is, um, is yeah, as what I said earlier, like how is it going to push into the direction? It is that kind of creativity tool in a sense, mm-hmm. but how, you're trying to do one thing and then the game pushes you in another direction or pulls, takes from you. So you hear like your own audio coming through from sound self, which is really important in it. And as you say, it creates those loops. So I mean, that was actually, I went from one point to another point there. But yeah, I think I find that all, hey, I'm wearing a uh, It's Six yeah, t-shirt, hello. But yeah, I find that all really interesting. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm really self-conscious now. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> well, I, I was, 
Francesco, like, uh, how did the, how did the experience change uh, in playing some sort of, uh, you know, because I saw it played, you know, by a bunch of people looking at the screen, and now you made the Oculus Rift version, which is played by just one person. Like, what, well, like, what do you think are the differences are? Sure. Like, what's the best maybe yeah. version to play? I can, I can answer that. That's excellent. I'm gonna hold it like this as well. Um, actually, I'm it like this because I have no idea how the pickup is. Um, so. I found that, I mean, we've tried it a bunch of different ways, and I, I sort of feel like the most important thing the Oculus Rift brings to it is isolation, not necessarily the 3D. The 3D really helps, but it's, it's more the isolation in that space. Um, playing with it in a multiplayer space with cushions and speakers and so on is, is much more technically challenging. Um, I, think, I think sharing that reflective space with somebody is really powerful and really intimate. I was, I was doing it with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was doing it with William, who is half of the Stanley Parable team, um, a few mornings ago, and we just spent like maybe 30 minutes together, and it was, I just met the guy, and it, it felt it, like a really bonding thing. So, I don't know, I think if I were to ask which one, or answer which one I think is better, I think the single player version is better, just because it's technically more tight, and we don't have to worry about feedback from the speakers. Uh, but it doesn't feel fine. Sorry? In terms of like an experience, you think the multiplayer? Like I think, I don't know. I, I, I think it depends. I don't think it's more powerful multiplayer. I, th I think it's different. I think it's like, well, how have you found Panoramical to be playing it with one person on the controls oh, versus actually, multiple? I, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, in design, I, I didn't design Panoramical to be a multiplayer experience. Like, I always thought of, you know, that the, my ideal player was one player controlling the experience, and then I found like the performance aspect of it, where one player is performing uh, for others to see, and how like having other people see what you're playing changes completely the, the experience. Uh, but then I saw when I showed you at shows and, and stuff uh, how people were showing together to play uh, in the same control, um, which was interesting. But at the same time, uh, I don't think they were engaging as much as someone yeah. performing uh, because they, it, it was mostly like a toy that they were playing around with yeah, yeah. than something in particular that they wanted to show other people. So in that sense, Panoramical, I think, uh, works better as a single player, like single player control experience for uh, other, for a crowd, for others to see. I guess uh, that's interesting. Uh, each person is conscious of the other person playing as well, mm. and like they might not be giving themselves over completely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd be very interested to see, because this is like, you touched on it, it's kind of get into that kind of the feeling, the mood of a crowd, whether maybe it's for a, at a football match or something, like, any, like you get swept up mm -hmm. in this kind of mood. And I'd be really interested to see, I mean, I don't know if you've maybe tried this, but like a sound self, like like a public showing in a sense, like with a really large crowd, or how that even might work, I don't know. I think it'd be, I think it'd be sort of weird. Yeah, an experiment. Yeah, I would like to try that. I, I sort of feel like, because sound self works when you are, when you lose that self-awareness, and I think the strength of sound self is that it um, it sort of encourages you to lose that self-awareness. Like, and the crowd not, like, contribute to losing your self-awareness inside the crowd? Yeah, absolutely. I, th I, think, I think you could, but I think for adults anyway, we're so kind of trained to be performative when we know other people are watching. Oh, hello. Um... <laughs> So so um <laughs> yeah whoa man um I think we're we're kind of trained to be more well I mean it's true even in this conversation I'm I'm I am so sort of aware that I'm going to be putting this out on the internet and I'm maybe a little more self um, watching myself more than yeah. I would if we were just um, drinking as we will be in yeah. 15 minutes or so um, so I think that. I think that's that's really interesting, you know, to explore a, a performance perspective. It's William! Come on in, come on in, come on in. No, not this way. Go around the other way. Um, so I think that's really interesting to um, explore. Oh, yeah, we're doing we're doing a, a conversation about it now. Um, yeah, you do. Here, do you want some of mine? No, I... Okay. So I think that's really interesting, but I think it's just much more sort of difficult to get into that 
to create the state. Right, right. Without to create a trance state where you're not aware of yourself when you are first aware that you and what you are doing is a performance. It's not that you, you don't have to win over one person. You have to win over like 30 people or how many people are there in a sense. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. Right and you have to win over that one person with the additional challenge of that one person being self-aware of the performance of what they're doing. And I think... Um, I think when you've just got a few people in a room kind of sharing an experience together, you can get to that space, and when you do, it's very, very intimate and very connecting. But I've also seen it become more like a toy, like you say, uh, when you have multiple people sharing it. And um, it's sort of, I think, easier to access that trans space in a, in a single, player, single player sort of space. What's been the biggest surprise and as through the development? What, what, like, so maybe w what's been the biggest surprise? Maybe from where you started and what you wanted to do to where you're at now? Because you're still like, you're still like, you're still exploring. You're still doing so much. But well, maybe what's changed most? Or what what did you learn that you didn't expect? That's really great. Uh, yeah. Um. Thank you for asking that. Um. I think that um, one of my biggest personal surprises um, just is that children really like it. Children get so into it. I see it's very rare that an adult in a conference setting, anyway, because a conference setting, you know, you're going from place to place, it's very rare in, that an adult in a conference set setting will spend more than a few minutes with it um, because, I don't know, they're self-aware, and especially when you're surrounded by people, right? But children will just play it and play it and play it and play it because they do what feels good, and the sound self rewards you for doing what feels good, as I'm sure Panoramical does. Right. Um, so that's that was a surprise, especially considering Sound Self was partially inspired by psychedelics. Um, but um, I guess an, an, another surprise, I mean, honestly, it's been very surprising how quickly it gets people into that state. Um, it can happen in about 15 or 20 seconds, even in a conference setting, which is just ridiculous. Um, it re and really exceeds my, my expectations. Um, I think that it's been really surprising to me it, it has been surprising to me how once people are play the game and then come out of it they're still sort of in that trance space for a few minutes and that's that was surprising to me and that sort of drove my decision to make it be an arced hour-long experience which is not implemented yet but i think that's important because we have to get people out of the trance space when the game ends otherwise they're like you know really yeah otherwise it's potentially dangerous um so, and this is not, here's another thing, like, this is not just restricted to this sort of video game. Like, any video game, not any video game, but lots of video games will get you into a trance state. They don't necessarily think about it this way, but... I, want, I, I, was gonna say, I, w I wonder one thing that maybe gets people into the state quickly is that you're doing something that there is no previous experience in a game of. You know, you're kind of, immediately by playing the game and by droning, you're giving yourself over. Mm. Like, it's not something that you have, like, previous experience of doing in a game, so you have no baggage, nothing to compare it to. And by... I ah, yes, I'm going to play this game. Like I don't mind if I'm going to look silly or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just going to go for it. People that immediately clicks on people, and because you don't have the past experience of like other kind of related things, I wonder if that makes it easier for them to to, to melt into it and just to go along with it. I sort of think the opposite is true, um, and I the only reason I say this is um, I've recently uh, been I've, d I've d I'm sort of taking a step away from hallucinogens because they can make you go crazy. Um, and I, I mean, I've met a lot of people who've done a lot of hallucinogens, and they, um, I don't, I don't want my, I don't want to melt my brain, you know. Um, and I've been, I've been looking for alternative ways to explore this space, and, and something I've been doing a lot of is um, sense deprivation, uh, which is lying in a saline-filled uh, tank and uh, in total darkness, and just letting your mind kind of race. Um, and the first couple times I did it, the, uh, it was very novel. And the novelty of it, I think, um, was a distraction itself. Okay. And I think I, I could see the same thing sort of being true in Sound Self. Like yeah. if you the first time you play it, I could see it being sort of novel, and maybe uh, repeated playthroughs would be less novel and more get you into the state faster. Um, you should totally read. Um, you should totally read all things shyness. I talked to you about it earlier because mm -hmm. like a big part of that is uh, craft as well, and kind of like the over a long period of time, kind of get into that. It's that zone where you just like it's not that you know how to treat the piece of wood or something, but 
it's how you see the words. You might not do the same thing twice, but you totally get into the zone like through practice. Mm -hmm. And it's something um, because David Foster Wallace, I think it was in the, the Pale King or something, like he was trying to look for a meaning in, in like a, a meaningless world, and he thought he could find it through repetitive like mundane tasks. Mm, interesting. Yeah, so I mean, there's definitely interesting stuff to look into, and uh, yeah, I, I definitely think you're onto something with. I mean, I think part of it as well is it's when you're not. It is when your mind is wandering. I think that's one thing games are really scared of is giving people space to think and think t like space to wander. And it's something like you think like think of Call of Duty like it is just like bam 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 like it's no downtime, there's no nothing. It's just and it's like it's I mean it's the difference between a film and a book maybe where in a film like it's it's whizzing past your eyes at like 24 frames a second and there's nothing you can do to stop it in an action film the explosions. But if you look at some of the more I guess critically acclaimed like art films very often like from the 70s it's the ones that are very very slow or like the camera is very staid and static and like not much is happening and I think that's really interesting because it's again it's doing something that's atypical for cinema and it's giving like people space to think and to experience rather than take in it's, just when you, it's like when you experience a piece of art like the first time you're kind of distracted by the plot twist of what happens and it's only when all that stuff has been already processed and you're just experiencing it that the interesting stuff happens, and I think that's like maybe key in sound cell. It's kind of what you were saying a second ago, where it is just about you not being distracted by anything, and you're just like kind of getting into a zone, and you're just mm. thinking, or even just like oh, well, even actually the key, to, I guess, to to um, meditating is even losing the thinking. Mm. Like that's the next step, and I find that really interesting, and hopefully we can see games that explore that. <laughs> 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 Yeah, we are now tomorrow. We Ooh. Fernando put Fernando in the same place as me. Epilogue. Um, so. I a different shirt this time, though. It's gonna ruin it. Yeah. Oh shoot. <laughs> we'll have to color correct it. Um, I'll make sure we color correct it. Um, so. Um, and just as a little epilogue, I was talking at the beginning of the talk um, a while ago about uh, taking sound self to Burning Man, and that was a really, really difficult experience for me um, because we sort of took on more than we can chew, and it was awful um, in that regard, in that it was just so difficult, and it put a lot of pressure on myself and my friendships, and we all had a breakdown at some point, and when you're having a breakdown, you can't really be there to support other people having a breakdown. So that was really difficult, but... Um, one of the sort of things we decided to do is uh, leave a guest book with, um, with the structure so that people could write their notes about their experiences. And um, at the time, I sort of wasn't in a place to receive that because I was just so stressed. I remember looking at the guest book halfway through the festival and just being completely emotionally blank and these incredibly loving messages. But sort of now, in hindsight, being able to read those notes, it's, um, it is so, um, I mean, we're trying something really weird here, and we're trying something really different, and it's, um, it is incredibly encouraging to, to read these, these notes of, of love, and to see that it's working, um, so that's, that's really awesome, um, anyway, that would be where I would, uh, end this video, goodbye, thank you for watching, oh, hey, hey, you guys should introduce yourselves as, as participants in this conversation. So Fernando, you start. Okay. I'm Fernando Ramacho, and I make Panoramical and other weird games. And I met Robin two years ago, and he's awesome. You're awesome. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Paul McGee. I'm an independent, independent developer in Dublin. And I'm working on some crazy music stuff and games as well. So, thank you. And that talk was awesome. Thank you, Robin, for giving it. Thank you for letting me... Taking takes so much time. This was this was. You guys gave me a lot of your time. I'm really glad. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's cool. And and anybody who's still watching this, you you have serious. Yeah, you made it all the way to the end. That's awesome. You just got an achievement. Achievement unlocked. Achievement unlocked. <laughs>